Beefcake. I love Final Fantasy. As a series, every game has the potential to be something new and untapped, opening the gates on different explorable horizons with fresh characters to potentially fall in love with. A title like Final Fantasy VII, the game responsible for introducing me to the series in the first place, left such a mark on me during my childhood that it literally affected the way I would feel about fictional characters for the rest of my life. I'd even say the cast from that game are partly responsible for me starting this show. Which is strange when you think about it because I ain't reviewed anybody from that game yet, have I? Yeah, I'll do it when I'm ready, yeah, don't, don't push me. Things are delicate enough as it is. But when it comes to Final Fantasy as a brand, I've not been the most steadfast of fans. I can't sit here and say I've been loyal to the series because when a title would release, if man wasn't feeling that particular game then I naturally wouldn't play the bloody thing. Games like Final Fantasy XII and XIII came and went without me so much as tilting my head in their direction because for one reason or another they didn't pull me in. They were lacking a hook or a visual aesthetic that catered to my tastes. So while I can say I am a fan, I don't follow the series devotedly and each new game that gets announced has to win my attention. Final Fantasy XV did just that. Even way way back when it was still being called Final Fantasy vs 13, something about this modernised fantasy drew me in. Maybe it was the clothing style, or the familiar yet fantastical take on cityscapes and technology, whatever it was had grabbed me and I couldn't wait to play it. And then I proceeded to wait 10 years because the game fell into development hell before waiting another whole year just for the PC port. Go on Square Enix, big up yourself. So did the game turn out to be everything I expected it to be? No it didn't. But while I feel the story suffered from awkward pacing due to half of it getting gutted out and shoved into DLC episodes, go on Square Enix, I'm going to say that I found myself caring more about the cast of characters as individuals rather than any major connection they might have had to the main plotline itself. The first character up on the mic is the one that captured my attention the most when we were introduced to the four boys and that is Gladiolus. Eh, you should probably expect spoilers. Since this is the very first Final Fantasy XV character I'm covering on Huda, I will have to provide a very brief run through of the backstory just so we can establish Final Fantasy XV's setting, then we'll touch upon Gladio's own placement within that story. Final Fantasy XV takes us to the world of Eos, a planet suffering from a plague known as the Star Scourge. This disease invites demons into their world to suck up all the yummy light and make it difficult for the people of Eos to continue living there. It had been foretold that eventually the Star Scourge will throw the planet into complete darkness, at which point the true king will rise up and restore the light, ridding the world of all this drama. Prince Noctis of the Lucis Kingdom is in line to hopefully become that king, but first he's got to sort out this little matter of a waging war between his country and some ends called Niflheim. The plan? Grab three of his brethren, hop into a very shiny whip, and go get himself married to Luna, an oracle whose task it is to help cure the land of the Star Scourge. Marrying Luna is part of a peace treaty between Lucis and Niflheim, and would have allowed the two warring kingdoms to chill if only Niflheim didn't fuck up the base by attacking Noctis' country anyway and murking his father in the process. Well done you pricks. So now, Noctis and his squad are out on road trying to arm him with ancient celestial weapons so that when it comes time to clashing with Niflheim, our rude boy is packing the sharpest shankers in all of Eos. Oh, and he's still got to deal with that end of days thing too, can't forget that. One member of Noctis' crew is Gladiolus Amicitia, a high ranking member of the King's Guard. It's his sworn duty to protect Noctis at all costs. During their childhood, Noctis was trained by Gladio, and although it might not have begun as such, the pair of them grew to become incredibly close friends. That said, being a friend to Noctis doesn't mean Gladio eases up on him, reminding us that throughout this story, he's still his mentor, and will constantly push Noctis to work harder. Visual design. He's got a mullet! Yeah, this dude here, in 2018, rocking a mullet hairstyle! Like the game ain't even a period piece, we can't say it's set in the 1980s to the backdrop of a quirky soundtrack because it clearly isn't, and yet somehow amongst this modern futuristic setting, a mullet hairstyle on a complete beefcake of a man somehow looks bloody awesome. I can't fault it, I think it looks really really good on him. The hair connects to his beard, providing a natural stylized design to his face and with all of that sitting on a chiseled jawline, it gives Gladio some really striking angles for his head. He certainly looks more rugged than the rest of the cast, but he's organically handsome in appearance. 
Gladio is the heavy hitter of the group, so he's built like a brick house, wearing an open button jacket that exposes his muscle toned build. The sleeves are short to further display his larger than average physique, while also showcasing parts of his tattoo that runs up both arms and down his back. The tattoo itself is of a bird of prey and actually holds significance to Gladio's design. Male members of the Amicitia family are given this tattoo when they are drafted into their roles as members of the King's Shield. It can be considered as a symbolic reference that they have come of age and are ready to accept their duties as one of the Royal Guard. The black jacket is matched together with black leather trousers and a pair of black boots to wrap up his whole appearance. Now, looking at him, regular viewers of the show might have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to say about this colour palette, and if your guess is along the lines of me thinking it's a dull and boring display, then you'd be correct, that's exactly what I think. As far as my personal tastes go, I'm not the kind of guy who has much appreciation for one singular use of colour within a visual design, especially black as I feel the only thing it does is absorb all the light from a character's appearance. If there are no assisting colours or even an accent colour to lean back on, then black as a shade gets too heavy for me and it isn't very engaging to look at. Gladio has absolutely no other tones going on with his design aside from his tanned skin. That's too drab for me and therefore I dislike the colours used for him. And yet, with all that said, and I think I'm going to surprise you all right now when I say this, but I respect it. I may not like it, it certainly doesn't cater to my tastes, but I actually have respect for this design aspect. Why? Because these tones are not just slapped onto him for the sake of appearing edgy or alternative cool. Black is the colour that represents the Lucian royal family. The royals and all their accompanying houses wear black as a mark of pride towards their monarchy. In fact, so prideful is Gladio about this colour that at one point during a visit to Lestalem, a more brighter city than their own, Prompto, a member of their group, makes a passing comment on how he likes the clothing here as it's much more vivid and vibrant, to which Gladio scolds him, telling him that instead of whining, he should be proud to wear these royal colours. So, the colour is not just there because Square Enix seem to love dead ass tones now, thank you Advent Children, but even if that were to be the case, I'm glad that there's an actual canonical reason for the use of black in Final Fantasy XV. They've put a bit of effort into giving things a reason for being and it makes it all the more believable, rather than having four boys drive around in the hot desert sun wearing nothing but black leather because the designers at Square Enix like it and fuck you if it doesn't make any sense. Aside from that though, I feel Gladio's appearance is very solid overall. His facial aspects provide a heavy dose of alluring attractiveness to the character, while his body shape and build accentuate his stability and strength. Personality. Gladiolus is a fearless dude. From birth he was educated by his father, knowing full well that one day he would inherit the highest ranking role of the crown's guard from him. He trained at every available opportunity towards it, and the strong, courageous attitude he developed during those years would carry through to his adult life. Very little could shake him. At one point though, his impervious nature did take a hit, causing him to second guess his role as Noctis' shield, and he went on a brief journey of self-discovery to regain his confidence, which was locked away on DLC. When it comes to the four boys, he's undoubtedly the most grounded member of the group, never mincing his words nor beating around the bush. Gladio tells it straight, sometimes to the point of confrontation. And this is where I kinda hit another personal grievance with the character. You see, prior to playing Final Fantasy XV for myself, Gladiolus appeared to be somewhat of a cheerful guy. All the screenshots I kept seeing of him depicted him as an upbeat character, a sort of Jack the Lad type with a bit of humour thrown in. Coupled with his visual design and a warm-hearted smile, the portrayal of Gladio in these images are partly what drew me to him in the first place, and honestly, I feel I didn't get the character that I had been expecting. I can't speak for the Japanese language version as I played the game in English, so if something was lost in translation then we could possibly chalk it up to that, but either way, I found Gladio to be a bit uninteresting. He doesn't seem to emote much beyond being casually irritated or angry, and any time he does lighten up, he still feels like he's coming across too serious or belittling. Photos depict him as a towering, lovable goof, but his involvement within the story and his interactions with the other characters made him feel like a stick in the mud. I think part of me was expecting a personality more in tune to Zack Fair from Final Fantasy VII, a strong-willed character with tremendous amounts of pride and determination, but all presented through a much brighter demeanour. Gladio isn't that type of guy. He's a tough guy, so he speaks in a tough guy way while saying tough guy things. You have a strong muscle man in the group. The most standard thing you can do with him is make him too serious, even when he has scenes where he's not supposed to be. And yeah, while the attitude does fit the character, it doesn't mean it's entirely interesting to watch, and I just feel they could have been way more expressive and creative with his personality. 
I also mentioned earlier that Gladio doesn't take any excuses and can at times be very hostile, causing friction within the group. His tough love approach, while obviously laced with good intentions, tends to crop up inconsistently too. During a moment when Noctis and Gladio are separated from the rest of the group, Gladio finds Noctis's whining to be a green light to scold him, thus starting an argument between them for no real reason other than to… what, create a rift of tension before a big boss battle? It felt a little jarring to watch. Later on in the game, after a character's death has affected Noctis's mentality, Gladio once again scolds him for not manning up. I mean, I understand the guy's angle for wanting to strengthen the prince, but it just feels like he's nagging on Noctis at the most inconvenient moments and not in the most productive of ways either. He came across as a bit of an arsehole on more than one occasion if I'm being truthfully honest. Gladiolus is not a complete dud though. His loyalty to his friends is always paramount to everything he does, so that at least highlights his good intentions, regardless of the methods being a little destructive at times. Gladio also has a few hobbies that allow him to feel unique within the group, showing us that he's not just a complete meathead whose only concern is hitting up the gym and pumping that iron. He makes numerous comments about how much he loves camping in the wild outdoors, showing us he has an appreciation for nature. I'd imagine that, what with his role constantly placing at Noctis's side within the confined walls of a city, getting to stretch his legs in wide open landscapes every once in a while, can be a fitting break from the norm. Camping and experience in the outdoors also made Gladio very resourceful, acquiring items for the group that will assure their survival. He also likes to read books, which touches upon the fact that Gladiolus is an educated guy, though the game doesn't spend much time aside from car rides and random hotel scenes delving into this side of him. In fact, the game seemed to want to spend more time elaborating on his noodle obsession instead. Like, there's even a fucking side quest for it and everything. Noodles, bruv. Noodles. It goes without saying, but considering the nature of the journey this group has embarked upon, and having someone as high profile as a prince be the central member of that party, a bodyguard of some sort would no doubt be a wise and likely inclusion to the team. Gladio fills that role and then some, he's one of the most important characters here. Not only does he have a sworn duty to protect the prince, but to also train him, so that when the time comes for Noctis to be king, he's physically and mentally strong enough to handle the role. A shield as well as an instructor, Gladio does seem to have the heaviest workload of the group, and most of his tasks put him in direct connection to the lead protagonist. While he initially despised Noctis during their youth, believing the young prince to be nothing but a spoiled brat, he eventually warmed up to him and a bond between the pair of them did grow. He's not only protecting Noctis because it's his sworn duty as a member of the Crown's Guard, but he's also looking out for his friend. The scar running down his face is visual proof of that, as Gladio received this injury by defending Noctis from a drunken stranger a few years prior to the events of the game. Of course, putting him in the role of an instructor, and one who initially disliked Noctis to begin with, meant Gladio's interactions with him are of a no-nonsense approach. He won't tread on eggshells with him, and you'll have to be the member of the group to provide that tough love, giving Noctis some harsh reality checks. Their friendship gets strained to the very limits because of it. As I said before, this attitude can be expected from someone in Gladio's position, though I just feel the timing and presentation of it was awkward due to the game's offbeat pacing. Gladio seems to have mutual understanding with Ignis, the group's tactician, cook and designated driver. In fact, I believe he's the only character out of their small group that Gladio doesn't have a short fuse with. There's a level of respect between them, which I feel might stem from the fact that they share similar roles of importance. They're both considered the adults of the group, constantly looking out for the youngers, knocked and prompto. Ignis too was born into a family whose duty it is to serve the royal bloodline, so perhaps Gladio finds common ground with him on that. Gladio's protective nature brings us around to another character, someone that's more of an associate to the group rather than a main member, and that's his own sister Iris. Alright, 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 alright. Iris, okay? I'll pronounce it how the game pronounces it, I'll call her Iris, but I ain't happy about that. No, I'm not happy about that at all. Square Enix gonna keep taking the piss with pronunciation, god damn it. Iris is a character that Gladio is super protective of, to the point he becomes worryingly concerned when she doesn't answer his phone calls, then disheartened when she would rather call up Noctis first before calling him back. As we see in the Gladiolus episode of the anime Brotherhood Final Fantasy XV, during their childhood, Iris wandered off one day and got lost, causing a heightened moment of panic for Gladio. It's likely because of this event in particular that Gladio harbours this sense of paranoia regarding the safety of his sibling. It's no surprise then when he tries to be there for her as much as he can. But Iris doesn't just provide context into Gladio's overprotective nature, she actually does something else for him, something better. And that is... Lighten him the hell up even if only for a little while. 
In the game, during the brief moments when Iris is around, you can see a faint dent in Gladiolus' tough as nails attitude. It might only be for a fleeting moment, but Gladio is given a chance to step out from his tough exterior, making him appear much more warmer and approachable as a character. This element is further touched upon during Gladiolus' anime episode again, where it shows a much more younger, playful Gladio spending time with Iris as they goof about. It's clear for us to see that of all the characters in the series, the one to put the most joy into Gladio's life is his sister. Iris compliments Gladio wonderfully, humanising this towering giant of a man, and while I appreciate the game touching upon this side of him, it sadly never seems to happen for too long, because Iris doesn't remain a party member for long enough. And I'm like, why? Yeah, why couldn't Iris stay as part of the party? Yeah, I liked Iris! Why did she have to leave? Wait, Iris, where are you going? Iris, come back, man! Baby, come back! As far as my personal opinions go, Gladiolus is probably the most divisive character I've reviewed on this show so far. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out where I honestly stand with him. When it comes to his visual design, he's got features that I absolutely love, and while I might completely, utterly dislike the suffocating amounts of darkened tones on him, because of the lore, I actually have respect for his colour palette being the way it is. When it comes to his personality, he definitely didn't turn out to be the fun, lively guy I was expecting, and while I feel there could have been aspects to him that were probably lost in translation, as well as issues with the storyline's pacing that caused Gladio to appear somewhat irrational at times, the character that he turned out to be fits a specific mould that the game required, but overall it's kinda underwhelming for me personally. The only thing about Gladio that I can't fault is his character role, because his importance is unquestionable. He plays his part and is connected in close proximity to the lead protagonist, not just by friendship alone, but by his role as a royal garden teacher. So, is he a bad character? No, I don't think he is, but I do feel his portrayal lacked refinement, and that's what makes me come away from Final Fantasy XV simply just liking the guy, but not loving him. And I really wanted to love him. All night long. What the fuck are you saying? Yo yo, this episode was brought to you by these wonderful people supporting me on Patreon. Without their help, this show would not be able to continue. If you'd also like to support Who That, please check the link in the description. Any and all help would be appreciated. Cheers everybody. Yeah.